Welcome to the Williart webinar. Uh, my name is Steve Statler. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Williart. Thank you very much for joining us today. I am going to be taking you through an introduction to Williart, which should take 20 to 30 minutes. And then after that, our Vice President of Data Products, Thaddeus Segura, is going to take you through some really interesting insights that have been gathered by his team in the field. Uh, we've changed the names to protect the innocent, but you should get a really good sense from that, the kind of amazing insights that this ambient IoT technology that we're here to talk about can light up and reveal in many cases for the first time. But before we get into that, I need to set the scene with you and explain a bit about uh, ambient IoT uh, a bit about Williot, and so I plan to introduce you to those things. I'll take you through some of the building blocks that uh, make up the technology that we sell, as well as that broader picture of something much bigger than Williot, which is the movement from the internet of expensive things to the internet of every single thing. And whilst this technology can be used for so many things, one of the key areas uh, is visibility into inventory and supply chain. Certainly not limited to that, but this is one of the areas where we're seeing huge momentum. So we'll be focusing a lot of the discussion on that. So Ambient IoT uh, is all around us. It's this ability to get visibility in real time, to not rely on people scanning or, or, or clicking to see where assets and inventory in the retail context, that can deliver a much better shopping experience, being able to find what you're looking for, having it in stock, having staff that can focus on storytelling and relationship building rather than just rushing around trying to find the, 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 the last thing that people have been asking for. For retailers, it means they can get much better productivity from the staff, so better utilization. Uh, by having the right thing in the right place at the right time, they can sell more. Uh, but that can be done with less capital tied up in inventory, lower shrink, uh, and even stores that are, are smaller and more optimized. So one recent award that we received that I think recognizes some of these benefits was from the National Retail Federation's Vendors in Partnership team, who awarded us uh, Best Distribution Innovation in, uh, in January 2023. So we're very proud of that, and that uh, helps to underline that it's not just us talking about these things, that other very informed experts recognize them as well. And on that note, let's talk a bit about the rise of ambient IoT. The Wall Street Journal published a story about this in Q4 of last year, laying out this massive change where the future of computing is everywhere all the time. Sounds a little bit like an Oscar-nominated film. You'll see that we were pleased to have our postage stamp size tags featured in the story. And of course, there were many other amazing companies uh, uh, Intel and uh, Amazon and Google uh, featured in the same story. But the point is that there's a change happening and it's a very significant one where more and more things are going online and it's not just the expensive things. And all of that is being achieved with this technology that allows us to create battery free Bluetooth connected tags. Uh, and those connections are, are going to be broadening out. So it's going to go beyond Bluetooth with new standards uh, coming from the folks that define 5G and 6G and the IEEE uh, teams that are defining 802.11. So it's a big movement and it's going to affect the future. But what I'm going to be talking about is what's available today. And for those of you that don't know Williot, let me give you a quick intro. We'll come back to the details uh, later. But at a high level, we are an ambient IoT pioneer. Uh, the founders of our company contributed to Millimeter Wave, which is one of the technologies that makes 5G faster than 4G. A previous company was bought by Qualcomm. And six years in, Williot now has hundreds of customers, uh, many small, innovative startups, 
but also a handful of the very largest companies in the world who are starting to connect their inventory and their supply chains and uh, are already ordering millions with contracts for billions of our devices, which we call IoT pixels. More on that later. Those IoT pixels are currently V2, V3 will be coming out at the uh, end of this year, but uh, version two has proved to be fit for purpose to uh, move forward with some extremely large projects. Our company has been privileged to be recognized by Gartner Group, one of the world's leading industry analysts, and we've been noted as a cool vendor. There's actually been a lot of other writing about us that you can find out from our website on our analysts page. And we do what we do with the help of some amazing investors, huge telecommunications companies like Verizon, NTT Docomo, uh, SoftBank, semiconductor companies like Qualcomm and Samsung, Amazon, obviously one of the largest uh, cloud companies in the world, Maersk, the shipping giant, PepsiCo, M Ventures, who is the, uh, they are the investment arm of Merck, the German pharmaceutical company. And then our final strategic investor that I'll highlight is Avery Dennison, the largest maker of smart tags in the world. So that's an important category that encompasses the, uh, the tags that, that we make. So what we're doing here is part of a continuum, an evolution from massive data centers where computers cost millions of dollars and were sold in their thousands that gave way to desktop computing where the thousands became millions of desktop uh, computers that cost thousands of dollars and then the computer in the handbag in the pocket which cost hundreds uh, and now we have a computer the size of a postage stamp with its iot pixels that really just cost a small number of pennies and are scaling to billions uh, in terms of the contracts we have today. And we see a clear path to trillions coming in the future, uh, which will be several orders of magnitude of growth beyond where we are today. And that is important, not just because these numbers are huge, unprecedented, but because of the problems that can be solved when you turn the lights on and you start to get visibility. It can make a huge difference in terms of productivity, increase uh, per capita productivity increase has not been looking good over the years. This graph is from the European Central Bank. And we believe by having that uh, omniscient visibility, knowing where everything is all of the time, this can be increased. And that's what our customers are seeing. A lot of the applications are designed around upgrading the systems that manage supply chains to so that they can survive and flourish in the area of omnichannel where approximate visibility is not enough. Um, one of the things that motivates many of us at Williar is also the fact that the efficiency and the visibility that we unlock can be used to significantly reduce and also to measure carbon footprint in new ways, a potent tool in the battle against climate change. And then lastly, the hidden tax that we all suffer from to a lesser or greater extent, depending on which country we're in, is crime, counterfeit, loss, theft, shoplifting, gray market. And with visibility comes a really great antidote to, to that. So the reasons why we do what we do go beyond what uh, many might uh, originally think to address some of these major challenges. So I've, I've been using the term ambient IoT a lot. Let's just define it. We'll start off with the root of it, which is ambient. Miriam Webster defines that as existing or present on all side. Uh, and that's a really apt descriptor for what we do when the tags, the sensors, the computing intelligence can be integrated into every single thing, then it certainly fits that definition. But also it's the infrastructure that reads and gives us the visibility to those things that have digital capability that is ambient. When the infrastructure is everywhere, when every phone, Wi-Fi access point, smart speaker, doorbell, set-top box uh, can read the and sense the intelligence that's coming from the pixels, then we will truly 
have an ambient environment. So ambient IoT is a phenomenon where devices can communicate and, and we go from the internet of expensive things, the cars, the uh, containers, and start to see the things that are inside the cars and containers, the products, the packaging, clothing, and even things like furniture and uh, the parts of cars and the parts of houses will start to become connected. Uh, and all of the communications and sensing is happening without tapping and scanning. And that's really important. Um, uh, barcodes, QR codes, RFID have been with us for some time, but they're typically read by someone that's doing something. And the thing that distinguishes ambient IoT from those legacy technologies is the fact that they're being read continuously without workers or consumers having to do anything. And that's important because it means that uh, you get to see the things that go wrong rather than just seeing things when people are doing their job. People tend to tap and scan when things are going well. Uh, and what we're looking for is visibility into the real world where not everything goes as planned. Now, ambient IoT is a technology independent term, but we have an opinion on it. And we believe that battery free technology where batteries are replaced by energy harvesting is the way to go. And the reason is it reduces cost, it reduces size. It means that the, uh, when you're harvesting the energy from radio waves, you get to the smallest price, uh, the lowest physical footprint, and it means you can embed those tags inside of the packaging, inside of the plastics and cardboard. And that is the key to true ambient IoT, in our opinion. So what we're doing has got uh, some important uh, ancestry, and we stand on the shoulders of uh, a number of uh, earlier technologies and build on top of them. So RFID is one of the most notable things, and that technology is scaling to maybe uh, uh, 30, 40 billion units a year. Ambient IoT is projected to get to trillions. And the reason why it scales beyond tags that look very similar, and in fact, uh, in many cases, are manufactured using the same process, but by swapping out the uh, legacy RFID chips with ambient IoT uh, technology, we, we have something that's born with the cloud in mind. That means there's end-to-end -end encryption it means that sensing is added to the capabilities. Every Willyar IoT pixel can sense temperature. And later this year, we'll be shipping humidity sensing, moisture sensing, proximity sensing, and light sensing products. And this ability to use the infrastructure that already exists. And that translates into readers that are often two orders of magnitude cheaper than RFID. And that means you can have them everywhere and you can get this visibility that has been elusive in the past that you don't require someone to tap or scan. Now, if you want to know more about Ambient IoT, go to our website, ABI Research have published a comprehensive report, which includes the market sizings that I referenced. They predict an addressable market of 10 trillion uh, things in the ambient internet of things. And you'll see the components of the industries that are impacted. Um, and it's free to download, uh, if, even if you don't subscribe to ABI Research, if you go to our website. A tech startup tracking thousands of products across the supply chain in an effort to reduce waste. The company uses Bluetooth technology to monitor foods, medical supplies, and other items with limited shelf life. And businesses are signing up to manage their inventories and cut their carbon footprints. CBC senior climate correspondent Diana Olick with us now, continuing her series on climate startups. Diana, how does this work? Well, Shep, you may have heard of the Internet of Things, IoT. It means items that are embedded with sensors or software. And in the case of a startup called Williot, it's tiny tags attached to food, medicine, and other items that track every aspect of their lifespans in order to reduce waste. It's this ability to drive a very lean supply chain with only just the right amount of products that are in the right place at the right time, 
which we think is one of the keys to solving climate change. They do it with these stamp-sized computers powered by Bluetooth and attached to any product or packaging, from vaccines. It allows us to measure the temperature, uh, the location, the authenticity. To zucchinis. Each zucchini that goes into a crate joins a unique monitoring path. Smart crates monitoring everything moving from farm to fork. Williot is working with label giant Avery Dennison, which is manufacturing millions of these tags and connecting them to the cloud so they can be tracked anywhere, anytime. By knowing where a product is, what's happening to it, where it's from, you can act faster. And so it's about taking data and turning it into actionable insights. Insights that ultimately work to decrease waste by monitoring delays and shelf life. Williot is seeing massive demand as the makers of just about everything strive to reduce their carbon footprints. Last quarter we quadrupled our revenue and I, I expect when we leave this year then that growth will be uh, on an even steeper trajectory. Statler says clients include some of the largest pharmaceutical, apparel, and grocery companies. Backers so far, Avery Dennison, Verizon Ventures, Amazon, PepsiCo, Samsung, and SoftBank. Total funding, $270 million. And not only can this technology reduce waste, but it also enables companies to quantify far more accurately their carbon footprints from the point of manufacturing to consumption. That'll be really helpful for corporations as new regulations on emissions are clearly coming. Shep. Diana, thanks very much. So that's a quick introduction to what we do and how we do it uh, from CNBC. I'm going to drill down into this a little bit more just to clarify a few things. So you saw that the IoT uh, pixels that we were demonstrating for that particular news segment, each one has got a Bluetooth logo on, which means that it's interoperable and can physically be read by any Bluetooth device. Those devices need to have an app or firmware on there so that they know what to do with those readings. But the point is that at a physical level, there's already a communications link that doesn't require pairing. So our tags broadcast out the data and advertise in the same way as your printer, your uh, smartwatch, or your car radio uh, broadcasts Bluetooth packets out prior to the pairing uh, process required. So no pairing needed. There's an FCC logo on, which is there unlike an RFID tag, because these are active radios. So they're accumulating energy all the time. They can take a weak signal, accumulate the energy from it over time, and then broadcast a stronger signal. And that's really one of the things that defines an active radio, even though it's in the kind of footprint and at the kind of price point that typically you only got from a passive auto ID uh, sticker. So we do sense uh, every Williot tag senses temperature uh, and there's all these other things that I uh, described that are coming, uh, but we don't do it with an extra chip. We keep the cost down by having a single chip and we use the antenna for a lot of the sensing, especially things like uh, proximity and humidity. And we call it a computer because it has an ARM processor, actually has three cores, two of them proprietary, RAM, ROM, flash memory. That's all included. And what we do is enabled by what we believe is the industry's leading energy harvesting technology, harvesting energy from weaker signals, retaining the power for, for, for longer, and then using it in very innovative ways uh, that weren't available before to do the computation, the encryption, the sensing and communication that we do. IoT pixels come in two form factors. One is uh, battery free. That's by far the largest component of what we do. It allows us to address much lower price points but we do have a printed battery version of our product for situations where works with williot infrastructure the devices that are required to energize and read our tags do, do not exist so battery free technology only works if there are devices around that know how to talk to our, our tags but if you're in a very large network of uh, retailers that don't have that infrastructure, then battery assisted pixels are the way to go. Good for high value assets, uh, still a lot cheaper than the average tag or beacon uh, around about the, the, the $1 price point. So if you're trying to get 
clear in your mind what the deployment architecture looks like. Here is a diagram that shows what that looks like. So our tags talk to devices that we call bridges. They're like a stepping stone between the devices that are the gateway from a location and the broader world, uh, world wide web, the, the broader internet, uh, the wide area network. So gateways are made up of phones, Wi-Fi access points, and, and other specialized devices that may be uh, like telematics gateways that translate between Bluetooth and the network protocols that get us to the cloud. So the bridges are the devices in between that. Uh, the range between a bridge and a pixel is up to 10 meters. And there are a variety of vendors that make works with Willio uh, bridge devices um, as well as different kinds of gateways for different kinds of situations. Um, those gateways talk to a cloud. We have a, a platform at a service layer, which is actually the thing that we sell. Uh, so we enable third parties to make tags, to make bridges, to make gateways. And the thing that Williot sells is the platform as a service, which costs uh, tiny amounts uh, if you look at each uh, item. But those are the things that manage the privacy and interface with the applications on the far, far right, which are the things that people are actually interested in using. So as you trace the path of data from tags to these edge devices and into the cloud, there's software at every level, software that uh, Williot provides. Uh, very often it's open source. All of our edge device software is available for anyone that wants to create a works with Williot device or add compatibility, you can go to uh, GitHub and download it. And so that software is a really important part of what we do. Sometimes in the early days, people said, well, just give us the tags. But if you have 100,000 tags, maybe even a million tags in a location, managing the flow of data through the edge, distributing the processing, doing the encryption and decryption and relaying and caching, all of that requires software. And so what we provide goes way beyond the tag through the edge into the cloud and into applications themselves. So let's shift gears and move to what you might actually do with this technology. Again, there are applications really broadly in many, many markets, especially healthcare, defense, agriculture. But I'm gonna focus on retail because it's just something that everyone can relate to. We all shop. So hopefully this gives you a sense of what we do and all the benefits that we deliver, which I, I referenced earlier. Here are a few slides that give you a sense of what this light looks like in action. So on the right hand side, you can see a, a time capture of asset tracking in a store. And in this case, it's reusable bins that are very often used to transport items to the back of the store and then used for stocking purposes in the store. So this shows that we can track that in real time. And the reason why this is interesting is that a lot of the processes that might be manually intensive in the receiving area can be automated if you know that something's arrived and where it is. And we can start to see and monitor different stages in the stocking and replenishment process automatically requiring less people and more insights into where the process is working and where there might need to be triggers to uh, unblock uh, or resolve issues. So one issue that might need to be resolved is around uh, shrink. And what we've seen is by having infrastructure that's pervasive and tags on everything, we can very quickly see when things disappear in ways that they, where they shouldn't be disappearing. And simply the knowledge that this can be detected is, is often enough to uh, be an antidote to shrink. We've had retail customers that have seen very high levels of shrink drop to almost nothing once everyone involved knew that the exact time and place that things disappeared could be measured. On a more positive note, looking at inventory in real time can be very useful. This graph shows the fact that we can look at inventory levels hour by hour and then minute by minute. And one of the applications where this is very useful is uh, looking at restocking when 
key items disappear. Uh, not a minute before, not a minute uh, later, the, a trigger can inform staff in the store and help them when the last medium black t-shirt disappears, they can be informed and that can be replenished so that when people are browsing, they find what they want automatically and uh, inventory that may have otherwise been hidden is put to good use and translates into a better shopping experience and more sales. So I want to wrap things up here in terms of applications and just mention something that is really important, which is the sustainability environmental benefits. Williot is seen as being a clean tech company. As such, we were honored to represent Israel at COP27 at the end of last year. And the reason we were given that privilege is, was the three pillars of what we do from a sustainability and regeneration perspective. One is by seeing where things are in real time, we can reduce waste. We can see when perishable products are stuck, uh, sometimes for days in places where they shouldn't be. And uh, by raising alerts immediately, we can take an existing supply chain and eliminate uh, loss and waste. And very often that waste, if it's uh, in the case of food, can translate very quickly into methane or CO2 equivalents. And uh, uh, by um, shortening the time from the field to the store, we can have fresher products that look better, taste better, and uh, are wasted a lot less often reduce the carbon footprint that way. Another thing we can do is help the move to something called demand chains, which is a completely re-engineered supply chain based on real-time visibility, very often even in wholesale distribution channels. So a manufacturer that might not normally see inventory levels of the product because it's been handed off through a chain of distributors and to multiple retailers can suddenly start to get visibility in real time and that can allow them to drastically reduce the amount of product they have to manufacture to make sure that they don't have any gaps in shelves in their wholesale channels. And uh, so that's a redesigned uh, supply chain, a demand chain. And then lastly, this visibility can also be used for real-time carbon footprint measurement. Typically, best practice is once a year. If I can get that daily, then I can start to run my company on that. and Carbon can be a proxy for cost. So we see this as a move from uh, the next generation of quality measurement. And even if you don't care about the environment, uh, but what you care about is profit, then measure, measuring based on carbon footprint on a daily basis can be a great way of eliminating waste and increasing profitability, as well as making much more rapid progress to the uh, sustainability targets that people are having to sign up for based on the latest uh, US and EU legislation. All of what we do, it, it's not done our own. Hopefully you've got a, a sense for that already, uh, but we rely on a very significant partner ecosystem. We're very keen to bring on more partners to flesh this out further. These are just a few of the partners that we have, and they span a number of categories, solution providers who uh, provide a one-stop shop, infrastructure companies that range from all of the major Wi-Fi access point vendors whose solutions work with Williot, but also other edge devices that allow tractor trailers to know what's inside them and what the temperature is of every crate and case. And then the folks, the qualified manufacturers that make the, the tags that take our chips and turn them into something that works on different surfaces and is helping us, uh, helping us to scale to the billions. And then lastly, we have the service providers, the, the systems integrators, the management consultants, and the boots on the ground that can help with deployment. So it's a big ecosystem, and we're really pleased to uh, uh, introduce uh, the parties that need these services uh, and want to collaborate across uh, this diverse ecosystem. So if what I've described just now sounds intriguing, but you really want to get your hands on the technology, you can do that at a relatively low cost, $150. Uh, if you go online to williot.com, the innovation kit is there. There's a, a couple of varieties of tags that work on cardboard and work on plastic. There's a couple of bridge devices that allow you to experiment and have your technical teams get some firsthand knowledge of this technology, whether you're an end user, you want to kick the tires, or if you're a partner, 
and you want to uh, start the process of building your own solution based on the first ambient IoT technology to scale. So that is it from me. I'm going to hand over now to Thaddeus, who's going to give you uh, some really interesting insights into how this technology is being used, the data and the insights that we get from it. So over to you, Thaddeus. So thank you, Steve. I appreciate uh, the introduction and the information for all the context. Uh, again, my name is Thaddeus Segura. I run all the data products here at Williot. So I'm responsible for the analyst teams that work directly with the customers, the research and algorithm development, and of course, packaging all that together into reusable data products so that any customer can come and benefit from the Williot IoT technology. What we're going to get into now are a couple of actual stories of way we've actually deployed with real retailers uh, and pharmacy customers and take a look into the data. Now we're gonna get pretty deep. I'm gonna show you some fairly raw data so you can kind of understand how these individual pixels come together to form a story. And just a fun fact, um, the pixel really is like a very powerful name because if you think about like the pixels on your screen, there are millions and millions of these points and they come together in the individual pixel on its own, it doesn't show you the whole picture. It's like a single piece of a very large puzzle. But when you see all these pixels together, it paints the image that you see or the, the picture you're looking at or the movie you're watching. And our technology is very similar. So when I show you this data, again, I wanted to focus on the raw data and show you a whole lot of data points, but I'm gonna talk you through how this stuff comes together and helps us see a story uh, and see the whole picture from these individual data points. So before we get started, uh, we wanna just talk about trade-offs between full visibility um, and what that would require and where we think the sweet spot is. So what we're not trying to do is see 100% of every single pixel all of the time. It would be one, too much data. It would be too much infrastructure. You'd have to saturate every single place that you wanted to see with a bunch of devices. And that's really not what we're going for. What we're going for, again, goes back to that pixel idea. We're gonna see little bits and pieces of the picture at all sorts of different times. And we're gonna minimize the amount of infrastructure we need so that you can basically go out and form that picture without having to deploy millions of devices all over. And that's really one of the key secrets to Williot and Ambient IoT in general is that in the long run, we see that the dependency of the amount of infrastructure we need is gonna to continue to come down with each generation of the tag. So as Steve mentioned, we're at generation two today. Uh, we'll be coming out with generation three next year, and that will significantly decrease the amount of infrastructure we need. So as I'm showing you this data, keep that in mind. And the other thing I wanna talk about is that we're doing as much as we can to reuse existing infrastructure. So because our devices are so small and the form factor is, is so minimal, we can actually deploy these on all sorts of things and just run power over USB or from battery packs or from existing plugs uh, without having to install like 240 watts power, 240 volts, uh, or run all this wiring. We can really do a lot of very flexible things. And so we've done things like uh, put them on autonomous floor scrubbers, put them on forklifts and pallet jacks, pretty much anything with a power port, we can run these things off of. So very quickly, we're able to deploy infrastructure and we can even put these on things that move. So rather than saturate a 2 million square foot DC or a 200,000 square foot store, we can put these on a handful of things that move around and see everything we need to see and piece that together again by capturing those pixels and those little bits of information um, and stitching it all together. So let's get into some stories and actually talk about some of the things that we have seen in the past. So I want to talk first about a strawberry story. So we were working with a large retailer and we uh, were tagging outbound merchandise going from a food distribution center to a store. And so each case of strawberries had a tag on them. And while we were watching it in transit, we saw a bunch of things happening. And again, all this was happening in real time. So we were watching the data and we were seeing that these strawberries were dipping below freezing um, while they were in transit, which was a little bit concerning. So while we watched the data, uh, we saw these start to freeze and then they thawed and then they freeze and they thawed. And strawberries are one of those things that are very, very sensitive. Um, so if you start to get uh, long periods of time of being frozen, it will really affect the taste and the texture of the strawberry. So all together, uh, this took about 69 minutes of total freezing time uh, before it finally made it to the store. So we were already watching this. And then when it arrived at the store, we started to see the temperature climb. So we watched the temperature climb and climb and climb. So we were already really interested in what was going on here. But before we even hopped to the store, there were more interesting things that had happened. 
So first of all, this distribution center was only 19 miles away from the store. And this pallet was on this trailer for four and a half hours. So from the DC to the store is 19 miles. It was loaded and held the temperature for four and a half hours before it made it there. So this is the whole time this is burning diesel to keep this at temperature and keep the temperature down. And so one of the things we saw really quickly was that there's a lot of inefficiencies in the supply chain and how this was basically being processed that we can provide as a new insight to this retailer to help them optimize this process and reduce the amount of fuel that they're spending to keep this stuff at temperature. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, we saw the temperature start to climb. And rather than just watching this, because we actually had location information on this, because one of the key data points that our uh, tags provide is location, we're actually able to go to the store and actually figure out where these strawberries were to see what was happening in real time. So we made a call and went into the store. And what we found is that these strawberries were pulled to the sales floor and were just sitting out here on the sales floor waiting. And they were out there at 628. And we waited and we saw even more merchandise come out to the floor and it was still out there at 653. And we got curious uh, while we were waiting, obviously out there for around an hour. So we went over to the strawberry display to see maybe it was completely full and there was nowhere to put these. Um, but as you can see, the strawberries were pretty much wiped out at this point and they were still out here at 719 before they were finally pulled into the cooler. So if you're the person buying these strawberries, you've now had a strawberry that was very carefully maintained from the farm to the DC and held in the DC at a very consistent temperature. But as soon as it went onto the truck, we saw it start to freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw, and then hit the store and hit 80 degrees and sit there for another hour and a half before it was finally brought back down to the temperature. And so all this impacts quality. And so we started getting curious, like, is this happening more broadly? So if you take a look at uh, the actual transportation, you can see a whole bunch of interesting things on here. So I don't want to get too deep into this because we could easily spend a half an hour talking about this single slide. Um, but if you look on the right, there's a little legend showing where the pallets were placed in this trunk. And you can see the different temperatures. So you can see there's a difference in temperature between the middle and the front and the back of the truck. You can see these clear cycles of temperature where things seem to rise over time and then kick down and then rise over time and then kick down. And these are actually the cooling cycles of the AC. And you can see it happening across all these pallets. You can even see that there's a little bit of lag between when it starts cooling uh, different parts of the actual cooler. There's a bunch of things you can see there, but what you can also see is that temperature acts as an indicator of where things actually are placed. Because as these are coming in, we can actually see these get unloaded. We can see when each individual pallet came off of the truck. Um, we can see how quickly it made it over to the cooler and if it came back down to temperature or if it was even pulled back out again. Now, it's interesting if we're trying to manage state change or understand as things are going, um, but there are also some products that are very, very sensitive to temperature while they're in transit. So bananas are one such example. And ideally, you keep bananas right around 56 degrees the whole time you have them in your, in your life cycle. So 56 to 60 is really their sweet spot. Uh, the warmer they get, the faster they're going to ripen. The older they get, it'll actually really compromise the quality of the banana if you've ever bought in like a gray banana, that's because they were stuck in a cooler for some extended period of time and it will really compromise the freshness. So as we dug into bananas, one of the things we saw was that these bananas happened to be below 56 degrees the entire time they were on the truck. Um, some going all the way down to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very, 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 very cold for a banana, um, very much not good for the overall quality of the banana. And so we started wondering, does it depend on where these things are placed? Because in theory, bananas are actually wrapped in plastic in a large plastic container before they're put into this truck so that they're insulated a bit from the temperature. Um, as bananas ripen, they actually put off a gas that protects and generates its own heat. And so if you wrap it in plastic, it should be insulated. And so we should have seen this clear temperature difference between the pallets that were bananas and the ones that were. And we didn't see that at all. What we saw is that the bananas were actually slightly colder than the rest of the pallets on the truck suggesting that the process hadn't been executed, which is why we saw this big gap in temperature. We kept watching this over the next couple of days. And after a couple of days, we finally saw a route that was exactly what we'd expect to see. So this is a situation where this was well executed. Um, you can see that the bananas were significantly warmer than the other pallets on the trailer the whole time. So the orange points here are bananas, the blue points here, are everything that was unwrapped. So these were placed properly in the truck right where they were supposed to be. They were wrapped in plastic just as they were supposed to be. 
This kept them significantly warmer the entire time they were on the trailer. You still see the same temperature trends that you see across everything else as the cycles kick on and off, but you see that they were much better insulated. And when they went to the store, they went straight over to an area. It kept them at a really consistent temperature while the rest of this merchandise ended up over in a cooler where it should have. So the point of all this is that we're allowed, we can actually start to show much, much more granular data. And so you can actually start to piece together what's actually happening. And we call this an end-to-end -end X, right? Because in the past, you've never had the ability to see what was going on inside. You had some pain, but you didn't really know what was going on or how to fix it. And you never had the granularity to be able to, to peek behind the curtain and see what was happening inside. And that's what Williot allows you to do. So uh, we can go even a little bit deeper and we can actually start to understand these bananas uh, and what actually happened to them throughout the entire cycle. So what I just showed you was really in transit and then arriving at the store, but we can actually trace this all the way back to the distribution center, the temperature they followed while they were staged. And then of course, how each individual case on that pallet individually was affected by the temperature rather than just the whole pallet itself. And then we can even see what happened to those individual cases as they hit the store to understand if they went to the sales floor or they went to the baler to understand when individual cases were being stocked, which starts to unlock things like first in, first out and really fresh the cycling. So if we focus on just the store, we see that the first cases hit the sales floor about 13 hours after they were received. So you can start to understand how much safety stock did the store actually have? Were the bananas that were there a few days ago actually selling out? Uh, 13 hours is a little bit faster than I'd expect to see for most retailers. Normally you'd have a day or two of safety stock. You'd be rotating to the floor. This means the bananas came in and went pretty much right out to the floor on the next shift. And then we start to see that some of those cases were selling out as soon as you know, four hours after they were placed. So these new ones went to the floor, they were stocked directly to the display. And then we see the boxes that they were in go back to the baler and get packed just 17 hours after they were received. So you can start again to piece this together and see really what's going on at a very granular level uh, within these supply chains and within these stores through these pixels, uh, giving you little bits of data that you can piece together into a holistic image. So we can go further and look at what happened on the trailers and start to understand temperature compliance while they were en route. So by just putting a couple of tags on each pallet, we're able to see the exact map of the temperature while it's in transit. We can track this over multiple days to understand if there are nuances or differences from trailer to trailer. And here's one such view of that. So you see this is in Celsius, but actually it's in Fahrenheit, excuse me. Uh, there's a three degree gap between two different trailers over about seven routes. So you can actually see that this one sits significantly colder than this one, and that there's also a lot of variability in this. I mean, you can actually see where the variability exists in terms of the overall load map. So you could start doing things like actually having a, a trailer of level load map because you'd understand the nuances of how each individual trailer performs. And all this could be done programmatically. Most companies already have uh, load mapping built in automatically. This can be just another input into some of those systems. We've also done end-to-end -end tests. So rather than just focus on a DC to a store, we have gone all the way from the supplier and tied merchandise. We've even gone all the way to the cardboard manufacturer. So we've put these things on when the cardboard's being made before it's handed off to the supplier and the merchandise is packaged. And then uh, merchandise is shipped to a mixing center and then to a DC and then ultimately to a store and then ultimately purchased. And so what you see here is one such journey where we actually tagged at a supplier, tracked all the way through the inbound, all the way to the uh, store and saw a bunch of really interesting things. So one of the most interesting things you saw in the store was that you expect most merchandise comes in and either goes into storage or goes directly to the sales floor and gets stocked. What we saw here was that this merchandise actually came in and took seven separate journeys from the back room to the sales floor. So it came in, they tried to stock it, it was full. They brought it back to the back room, put it in storage, brought it back to the sales floor over multiple days uh, and attempted to stock it from 314 all the way to 322 before it finally fit on the shelf. And then the box was finally put into the baler. And so this allows you to see really interesting things around the actual efficiency of things happening inside of the store. And again, this is not merchandise we tagged to the DC. This is something that we incorporated all the way back at the supplier, but we're able to track all the way through and just see this as a uh, added benefit and unexpected value because we're really just trying to watch this through the supply chain. Um, but the real interest here came at the store at the end. And so that is the power of Williad. 
as this infrastructure comes down in costs and as it's easier and easier to deploy, we'll have this in more and more places and you'll start to see insights just like this all over, even if it wasn't what you were actively trying to track. So that's the example of a large retailer. Let's get into a pharmacy use case as well. And this will go in a little bit more depth into a couple of examples, and then we'll finish up. So we worked at the pharmacy retailer and they wanted to see a couple of other things. There were some major differences here in terms of how merchandise flowed between this customer and the last one. Specifically, this customer focused on reusable containers, plastic containers that were filled with merchandise and went through the supply chain over and over again. So rather than having to tag a box that went through and was ultimately thrown away, you'd only tag these once. And then once you saturated your whole chain, you'd be able to see these totes as they moved throughout the chain or forever. We'd just continue sending data as long as we were subscribed to it, and you'd be able to get those insights with a single investment into tags and infrastructure. So the way this works to, in terms of data hierarchy is that we have very raw data layers and we have encrypted data that comes off the tags and then we decrypt it and simplify that down into what we call events. And that event data allows us to start providing like the most raw data to a customer that would be usable. Uh, before that, the raw data that comes off the tag is, is very dense. Uh, very complicated and really too much information to be able to work with. Um, but this event data is the first level of data that's really usable by the customer. We typically group that into insights or we put that into what we call playbooks and then that outputs actions. So a very tangible example would be you know, if you're monitoring those bananas and they drop below 56 degrees for a longer than 15 minutes, you get some sort of alert or you could even integrate that with uh, temperature control on the truck and start kicking off the cycle. And so there are very simple things you can do there. Now, because this is an actual computer embedded in the tag, you can also directly take those raw inputs and build machine learning models on top of them. And that's something we did with this specific customer. And I'll talk about that shortly, but I wanted to give a brief introduction to that here because it's a slightly different view of the data. So one of the things you see here is also geolocation. So in the last slide, I showed you what it looked like inside of the truck. But if you take a bird's eye view, we can also track what's going on from DC to DC, and while it's in transit. We can see how the temperature changed over time. We can even see what happens when it arrives at the facility. And as it's moving from the facility through the parking lot to different parts of the building, especially for larger buildings, uh, this becomes even more useful. This customer also had some temperature compliance. And one of the interesting things we did here is that we actually created three-dimensional maps of the pallets to understand how the temperature varied within a single pallet based on like the height or the Z location of the totes in that pallet. And what you see here is that there was up to a 15 degree variance between the bottom. Uh, this is an exploded view. So you're seeing over here on the left, the inside of a pallet. Um, there's up to a 15 degree variance between the items at the bottom to the items at the top. Now this really matters a lot if you're thinking about um, specific cold chain merchandise. And if you have ambient trailers um, that aren't refrigerated, but you still have some temperature controlled merchandise, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, there are some things that you could want to put at the bottom. Um, so you can again, start to incorporate this information into how you build pallets or how you uh, load the trailer. So this is an actual view of what we provide to a customer. Now this would actually be interactive for a customer. So they could actually zoom in and see how these individual items were traveling throughout the supply chain. Uh, in this case, what you'd actually be able to see is uh, things moving from an individual forklift to a staging area, to uh, an outbound, finally onto a truck. This traveled to a second distribution center uh, before it finally arrived at the store. And then you can actually see the temperature of the individual tote at the store for multiple days before it was picked up and brought back to the distribution center. I can't show the real data because it actually contains some sensitive customer information, but in some of these things, there's a bunch of nuances you can see, which is one, first of all, the granular travel. Um, and two, you see two different waves here. And the reason for that is that we have tags on two different sides of this container, and this was left behind the building. So you can even detect which side was facing the sun versus which side was facing away because of the sensitivity of the tags. Um, and then ultimately, you see that this tote reached 111 degrees on its travel back. Not a big deal when it's empty, but definitely matters when it's full and there might be some uh, sensitive, temperature sensitive uh, merchandise inside of there. So getting into some of the machine learning, here you actually see where we built this model and what the customer wanted to see was if there was an association between individual totes 
and different palettes. They wanted to understand which tote was going on to which palette and if we were able to do that. So what you see on the left is some of the raw data that we actually receive off of the tag and taking that raw data and parse it between the signal and the noise, uh, plugging it into different things and testing, we were able to get a 98.9% .9 prediction accuracy. So around 99% of the time, we we're able to correctly associate an individual tote going on to a specific palette and correctly predict which one that was. Tesla was very happy with it. Um, it was actually really useful when we got to the store and started looking at how things were being unloaded. So in terms of visibility, that's often a question we get. We did see 100% of the totes in this situation. We had two tags per tote. Uh, we saw everything on week one and week two. We we're able to understand process compliance, how quickly things were being built and taken to staging, um, and how quickly things were being uh, staged and then loaded. So we're going to really see how quickly, uh, like how well the efficiency is running within the distribution center. We're also able to look at this in terms of distributions and understand if there are process violations. Again, what this would ultimately become are different alerts that we'd send to the customer so that they can understand if there's a violation, for example, over here, when this was sitting out for 700 minutes, uh, why were these pallets left out for, you know, 10 to 12 hours uh, before being loaded on the truck when everything else was loaded on here? Did they miss the truck? Did they go out on the wrong delivery? Um, all that becomes alerting that is actually actionable for the customer. So what you see here is an unexpected stop. Um, so this was supposed to go directly to store 12, but it I uh, made a detour and stopped at store 106 for about an hour. And we still don't know why to this day, nor could we get an answer from the uh, transportation team as to why this actually occurred. But again, full of surprises when you actually start tracking this stuff internally. In terms of consistency from week over week, another thing that you see here is that there's not a ton of consistency between trailers of the same company. So the first week, uh, this trip took 0.7 hours. The second week, the truck sat around for about eight hours before it finally left. And the merchandise inside of the trailer, I got quite warm, uh, hit up to 96 degrees uh, while it was sitting on the back of this truck. Now there was actually Halloween candy on this trailer. So I don't know what the quality looked like when it got to the store after it had been sitting out of the sun for quite a bit of time. But the, again, some of the things you can see when you start to dig into the data. Another thing that was on that truck uh, was Zyrtec which does actually call out that it should be kept below 77 degrees. In this case, it hit 94 degrees while it was on the truck for that specific tote, uh, which again could compromise the overall quality. So again, you can move away from models like FIFO and start understanding if there was actual temperature compliance violations at the individual product level. Finally, Steve already showed this, this slide. Uh, this is an example of actually understanding the process efficiency. Um, as these totes are being unloaded and then brought into the store. This was an example where the store was actually great in terms of process compliance. Um, here we saw 94% of the totes were actually unloaded and taken inside to be stocked within 30 minutes, which was significantly faster than we expected. However, one of the big things the customer hired us to look at was uh, tote loss. So they were losing thousands of totes a year, around $11 million worth of totes per year. And they wanted to understand what was happening to them and why they were going missing. Uh, we were actually able to actually find one of these go missing and figure out it had been thrown away. We're not entirely sure why. Uh, it seemed like it was still in good shape, but these were some of the things that they wanted to track down and some of the things we're able to see even on a first proof of concept. Again, as Steve mentioned, we were able to do real-time inventory tracking. So this top view is what they actually saw in the POS data um, as they saw the count go down. It was a daily update. What we were able to actually see was an hourly view, and we were able to actually disambiguate between what was on the shelf and what was on displays because we had items tagged at the individual level. So if you wanted to understand if something was selling off of an end cap versus off the shelf, we're able to see that in the data and differentiate between two of those states. Finally, I can't show you real um, dashboards because they are proprietary information, but you can take all of this and turn them into dashboards so that you can monitor this information, and of course, turn these into different types of alerts. Um, that can be for upstream. It can also be for uh, transportation. Um, and you can also do all sorts of aggregate views if you want to track what's going on in the store as well to understand you know, process efficiency, process compliance, et cetera.
So once again, I want to say thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your time and your attention today. Thank you, Steve. And if you guys want to learn any more about Willia, please visit the website at williat.com uh, or reach out to us on LinkedIn uh, at the link provided. Uh, thank you very much and have a great day.